Bonsoir, mon nom est Maude Prudhomme, analyste principal des programmes. My name is Maude Prudhomme, and I'm with the um, program for engagement of um, interveners at the Secretariat Federal, uh, the Federal Secretariat, Secretariat of the Anti-Racism Fight. For people calling in and joining us only by phone, unfortunately, you will not be able to speak. You will only be able to listen to the conference. However, you are welcome to send us your questions or comments by email after this session. For people joining us via the Zoom, we have attached a user guide which you can refer to if needed. Seulement pour les personnes qui se joignent à nous via l'application Zoom. For those who are joining us uh, through the Zoom application, This session offers uh, simultaneous interpretation. You can choose the language of your choice by clicking on the three little dots uh, at the bottom of the screen. Also, on request, we can uh, provide all of the French versions of the PowerPoint presentations that will be used during this event. Please turn off other streaming services to dedicate all your bandwidth to this meeting. Make sure to clearly identify yourself with your display name. Look for the three dots on your screen and select Rename. This will help us better identify participants that have sent a question. La plupart d'entre d'entre vous qui participez à cette réunion. Most of you participating in this meeting were uh, on the list of participants where you were registered. That is that you are on mute and you are not able to activate your camera. Please note that some of the participants uh, who, who have submitted a comment or a suggestion will be promoted as panelists and will be able to open their camera in order to speak. Here are the steps to follow if you wish to speak. Submit a question in the question and answers box, QA button. An organizer will identify your comment. My colleague Keith will name the participant and ask that person to raise their hand using the raise hand button. An organizer will promote the attendee to panelists, enabling them to unmute themselves, activate their camera, and then speak. Très important. Cliquez sur le bouton Levez la main seulement. Very important. Click on uh, raised hand only if you're asked to do so. Um, as for uh, technical instructions for this evening, Peter, I will pass things over to you. Thank you, Maud, and uh, good evening to all of you, first of all. I would like to... Um, Introduce you, Elder uh, Commander from uh, Kittiganzi. She will uh, give us a smudging ceremony and a prayer. will open the session with a smudge ceremony and a prayer. Ainé Commander, je vous offre du tabac afin que vous nous conduisez vers la prière. Elder Commander, I am offering you tobacco for you to lead us in prayer. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you for the protocol and the passing of the tobacco. And I have accepted uh, this uh, tobacco for this uh, meeting that you are having this evening on a very important uh, subject, decolonization and anti-racism. And we do see the need for decolonization and anti-racism in, in various uh, segments in all of um, in all of society including in academia and uh, i'm quite pleased to see that my my dear good uh, friend and colleague dr donna goodleaf will be presenting this evening and it, it's really important to hear those voices uh, that of indigenous peoples relating to the lived experience and knowledge relating to decolonization and anti-racism and research and academia we need to do this in a good way and i thank the organizers for asking me to lead in ceremony and and give a blessing for this meeting it is said that when we come together with that one mind that one spirit that one voice when we are all together it is important that we begin in that good way And why is it important? It is because it's of people. And we all have spirit and everything living and that is created and blessed to us by the creator 
has spirit. Our language, our languages have spirit. So that being said, we must honor that responsibility to ensure when we gather, and in particular when we're sharing knowledge, when we're sharing experiences, when we're learning from one another, we do so always in that good way with the help of the spirits. So I will light the sacred medicines in a few minutes. And what I want to, to begin with is that I raised this grandfather, Nimishon Miskinu, and I raised this grandfather to ask me to help you to lead your conference in an opening prayer and ceremony. But I begin first and foremost by saying, Miigwech, Miigwech Nitschkiwe Dug, Miigwech Kakena, Kibijan Oma Nongum, Pijajik Oma Nishnabe Ki Oma Mawinniwak, Kani Mitch Kijigun Kinu, Kitagan Zibi Donjiban, Miigwech. Miigwech kibijan oma. Miigwech ni jen wen daganag o mama wen inewag. Miigwech. And now I will light the sacred medicine and I will say a prayer and then I will say some words after the prayer is said. But I had to speak only in my language as I acknowledge the beginning of this ceremony of the lighting of the sacred medicine. That is our protocol. That is more than our protocol. It is our law that any time we have our sacred medicines that are that we ask to help us, only we speak in that language, that spirit that the creator has blessed our people with. And we must always acknowledge the first languages, the first voices of this land, which we refer to as Turtle Island, which is commonly known as North America, but whether it's Canada or United States, to us, it's our Anishinaabe key, it is Turtle Island, the first voices, the first breath, the first expressions of life are from all those indigenous nations that the creator placed here. And as I raise this sacred medicine here, you all, you are all part of this ceremony. We're not together face to face, elbow to elbow, but we certainly are together. And we are all in this circle, in this prayer at this time. And I ask that you Give your words of thanks, give your words of appreciation or that prayer that you may have for yourself or for a loved one or a friend in the way that you've been instructed, the way that you've been taught and in also in your belief system. And I say at this moment, miigwech, 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 gishimanado, miigwech. Kinake ego. Miigwech Jojo aki. Miigwech Kokomis de Pekisis, Mishomis Gisis. Das been again Kokomisug. Das been again Mishomsug. And now begis, we dokwish non onje kakina nongo. Ni book send dam gishimanado onje kakina minopomadzuin. Zagi edwin. Chimino taguzuin. Ne book send dumb gishimanado, and daso kijik, nongum, oma, kakina. Me gwedge, jojoaki onje, nebi shun, mishkiki, mitig, away say sug, nok shug, ah, chimi gwedge, me gwedge. Me gwedge pogutininiwag, chiwindigo con, me me gwesi, mushkadisi, a shish, misabe, and abigus, we do kushnang onje. Kakina, Miigwech. Miigwech onje mishkiki. Miigwech. Bonjour tout le monde.
Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the uh, uh, territory of the Algonquin. Uh, as always, I'm very proud to give words of welcome and to give you the blessing. To welcome everyone to the homeland that I am sitting on, the homeland of my people, the Algonquin people, the Anishinaabe, Omamawinaniwag. But I acknowledge I acknowledge the homelands, wherever you are at this moment, wherever you are sitting, the homelands of your nations, the homeland of, of, the, of those, the settlers and the visitors that have made this your home. And I ask that in our hearts and in our minds, that we always acknowledge no matter where we are, where we have made our work or we have made our homes, to always remember that those homes, those lands, we're here since time immemorial and we're always used by our people, regardless of what nation and tribe we come from. It is important that we come together. As I said in my prayer to creator, we thank the creator for all of life that he has blessed us with. We have thanked that first mother, our mother earth. We have thanked that first grandmother, our grandmother moon. And we have thanked our first grandfather, that grandfather's son. And we ask all those spirit helpers, we ask the grandmothers and the grandfathers of the four directions to bless this circle. And in my prayer for all who are here, that the creator loans you his wisdom, he loans you his strength, and that good words will be spoken, and that everyone will hear, will listen, and will feel with openness, with kindness, and respect. And just remember, that the indigenous peoples of this land, we have so much, so much knowledge, so much goodness, and so much to share, to make that change that is so needed, to make a new day whereby we don't have to gather any longer to talk about racism and talk about colonization. We need to do this. We need to do this together in that good way. So chimi wedge nishki we do ki bijano ma ni boksendam chimino tagozoin. And I thank the speakers who will be here this evening to share their knowledge and their wisdom. I thank you, you four the four speakers. Thank you, Peter and and Anne Marie and Maud and to everyone who's asked me to be here with you and I honor you and what you are the work you are doing. Mi wedge merci beaucoup tout mes amis. Thank you. Take good care. Thank you very much, all my friends. Love. Miigwech. Thank you, Father Commander. So is love, as you say. Uh, thank you for the prayer and your wa words of wisdom that remind us of the importance of centering uh, the voices and the realities of the first uh, peoples of this land. And I join everyone uh, this evening uh, from the ancestral uh, land of the Abisnabe uh, Peter people here um, in, uh, in, uh, in Ottawa. It is a pleasure and honor for me to be with you. I should also wish all of you welcome to this virtual assembly regarding the anti-racism initiatives in research and the uh, academic milieu. So for this evening, the religious communities which are raci racialized um, in all uh, political um, milieus and I'm very happy to be with you today as co-host of this uh, session. Make it happen. My name is Peter Flagel and I am the executive director of the Federal Anti-Racism Secretariat. We are truly honored to be with you this evening and it is part of our commitment to centering the voices of indigenous peoples, black, Asian, and other racialized communities to decolonize our efforts at the federal government to tackle systemic racism, identify gaps in, in our initiatives and advance new responsive initiatives that help us achieve the inclusive, equitable and prosperous society for all we all desire. The purpose of tonight's event is to give voice to address systemic racism in academia Identify the pathways towards decolonized systems change that really centers your voices and draws on the power of research to get us to that place. And I would like to thank Ballarama Holness of Montréal en Action, 
uh, Anne Marie Livingston of Mont Montreal Centre Filage and Pascal Anuel for co organizing this event tonight. And this again is part of our commitment uh, to working directly uh, with communities across the country to advance our joint commitment to eradicating systemic racism from our society. And now, please let me introduce my co host tonight, Anne Marie Livingston. She's a postdoctoral scholar with the Ethnic Immigration. Racial and Pluralism Studies program at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. Anne Marie is also the founder of Montreal Centre Filage, where she co authored a report on racial profiling. Please join me in welcoming Anne Marie. Ma co animatrice de ce soir est Anne Marie Livingston. My co-host is Anne-Marie Livingston, who's a, a postdoctoral researcher in ethnic immigration and imperial uh, studies at international and affairs and public uh, affairs at the University of Toronto. She's also the founder of Montreal Sacre Village, where she co-authored a report on... Um, please join me in uh, wishing Anne-Marie a welcome. Village is a research project. We're actually not an organization, and it's a multi-generational, multi-racial uh, re research team um, that conducted this project. So I guess I don't call myself a founder, but I'm certainly a member. And um, so I thought I'd give the background uh, to tonight's event um, just briefly that uh, we, this event is a follow-up uh, to an action that I and several members of Montreal's Black community uh, took in June, just recently in June, um, in which we wrote an open letter to the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, uh, expressing our concerns about um, funding that had been awarded uh, for research on racial profiling and systemic racism. And in the letter, um, you know, we underlined that the particular um, issue in question uh, was symbolic of a larger problem in Canadian research and academia of, you know, underrepresentation of Indigenous um, scholars and scholars of colour, um, of, um, you know, assumptions about, um, uh, or I, I guess a failure to take seriously the impact of systemic racism on, on research and uh, academia. And so in conversation with the anti-racism secretariat, we decided to pursue some more long-term actions to move the conversation forward around the topic of, you know, how do we counter colonialism and uh, systemic racism in Canadian academia? And so this event tonight is um, part of potentially two events that we'll hold this year um, on the topic. Um, and, you know, the subject is certainly not a new one. We've been talking about racial discrimination in, in, in public institutions and academia for years, uh, but it seems to have, um, I guess it changed at a snail's pace. Um, and so one of the purposes of tonight's ev event is to take stock of where we are in terms of the progress um, on racial e equity and decolonization and to draw inspiration um, and examples uh, you know, from policies, from programs and, and strategies that have been put in place uh, to counter col colonialism and racism. And so while the structural change may seem slow, uh, there are many people who are engaged on a daily basis, uh, you know, in their workplaces, in their organizations, in their communities, doing the hard work of uh, fighting racism and colonialism. And we have some of those people with us tonight. And um, so I'll be introducing them later. Um, but um, each one of them, um, you know, is someone who can speak from direct experience, from a, a long experience of, you know, what, what we can actually do um, in our individual lives and in our as, as members of communities um, to move progress forward um, on racial equity and um, indigenous um, emancipation or decolonization. So with that, I'll leave it up to uh, Balahama uh, to speak a few words, and then I'll, I'll come back and introduce the four speakers. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Balarama Holness. I'm the founder of Munchal in Action, an organization that successfully forced uh, the city of Montreal to hold a public consultation 
on systemic racism and discrimination. And for anyone who went to that consultation, they would know that it was extremely instructive and a phenomenal educational experience to understand um, the various elements of public life, whether it's um, employment, culture, public security, uh, income inequality, uh, to understand um, where we are living and how systemic racism and systemic barriers um, impacts us all. So Montreal in Action is an organization that believes that education is a fundamental tool and mechanism to empower not only our members, but civil society to ultimately engage their community. And a few words just on, on myself. I have, um, I'm currently at McGill Law finishing my fifth degree with a master's of education. Uh, I also have a bachelor's of education. And the power of education is in the following. During my master's degree, I read one very simple sentence from a text by Anion that said, low income kids get low income information. And that sentence made my blood boil so much that I ended up applying to McGill Law, taking four months to write that letter just to say that I was going to guarantee that I was going to get in to get back the education that was robbed from me in high school with that quote unquote low income information. So what occurs and the, the experiences that many minority populations have within the education system not only oppresses them by giving them poor information but ultimately rids them of important opportunities to contribute to society whether economically socially or culturally and the result is homogenous faculties across the board and curriculum developers whom are homogenous who create content that does not reflect a diverse 21st century Canada. So I lived my life in a way and attempted to build an organization that reflects the, the policies and the vision um, that we're hoping to instill in the education system. And my presence on the McGill Law campus um, is one of rebellion in the way that my mere presence on land by a McGillian or you know, James McGill, who was a slave owner, the very presence of people of color in these faculties speaks to um, a rebellious passion to not only educate ourselves, but to decolonize education and homogenous institutions. Um, so on that note, I, I will give it back to Anne-Marie to introduce the four panelists. Thank you very much for those inspiring words and urging us into action, Balarama. <laughs> um, so our speaker, four speakers tonight. Um, so we'll start with uh, Dr. Francis Henry. Uh, Francis Henry is Professor Emeretta at York. Um, she's been a prolific author. Uh, she's known for, um, with a co-author of having come up with the concept of democratic racism, which I used in my own work. Uh, she's also written about racial bias in the media and most recently co-authored a book on racialization and indigeneity in Canadian universities, uh, which she'll be speaking about with to us today briefly. Um, one of her co-authors is with us, uh, Dr. Melinda Smith. Um, Dr. Melinda Smith has recently been appointed uh, Vice Provost of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion at the University of Calgary. Prior to that, she was a Professor of Political Science at the University of Alberta. And what's important to know about Melinda uh, is that uh, she's been, I guess, leading the fight uh, for anti-racism for and th throughout her career. Um, and I must say that personally, I've on only had the pleasure of watching her from afar and being inspired by her fearlessness. Um, and it's a pleasure to have finally met her in person. Um, and so we have, third, we have Donna um, Gaherakus uh, Goodleaf, uh, who comes to us from Concordia University. Uh, she is Director of, de de of Decolonizing the Curriculum and Pedagogy in the Center for Teaching and Learning at Concordia. Um, she has a Doctor of Education, and um, so she'll be talking to us about the work that she's done with faculty uh, to transform their curriculum 
uh, you know, to uh, center the indigenous experience um, and, and to, uh, you know, decenter whiteness to, uh, de I guess, you know, principles of decolonization. Um, and finally, but not least, we have Aaron Franks, um, who also has a, doc comes, a doctorate. He's currently senior manager uh, for OCAP and information governance, governance, pardon me, at the First Nations Information Governance Center. Um, and OCAP stands for Ownership, Control, Access, and Possession. Uh, and this is a incredibly important framework that says, sets out principles for how research um, ought to be done, um, you know, on and about or with First Nations in Canada. Um, so I'm thrilled that he's uh, going to be sharing um, that with us this evening. And a final word I would say is that, you know, one idea behind this panel was that we would have, um, you know, conversations or sort of uh, presentations by indigenous uh, people uh, so that we can talk about settler colonialism and, and decolonization as well as anti-racism. In my own experience, I find that um, the two often are not put enough in conversation. And so this is an opportunity for, for me and, and I hope for everyone else um, to see what are the connections uh, between um, decolonization and anti-racism, particularly in the context of Canadian academia. Um, and, you know, those connections are not necessarily automatic. Uh, I would just share a quick word. Um, you know, today we were dealing with a question about bi bilingualism. And, um, you know, so it, the Canadian federal government is obligated to meet bilingual um, regulations, but when we're talking about decolonization, uh, one of the questions we need to start with is precisely uh, bilingualism in Canada. And so the, 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 the connections between anti-racism and, and decolonization um, still, have, uh, I guess we could say a work in progress of how we figure that out. So uh, without further ado, um, I'll leave the floor to Frank, Dr. Henry. Well, I've just unmuted my microphone, uh, so I guess uh, you can all hear me, I hope. Um, thank you, Anne-Marie. Um, I was really quite delighted to get this invitation from Anne-Marie because uh, she consulted me when she ran into this incredible situation in Montreal where a large grant was given to an organization that had no previous experience in studying um, anti-racism. Um, and uh, she did ask my advice, which I was happy to give. And uh, the result of our conversations about that issue brought about this um, invitation. Now, my own history in this goes back a very long way. I, uh, I think I, I published my first uh, sort of uh, expose of racism in Canada in 1974. So uh, that's, that's a very long time ago. And I've been sort of uh, working on these issues ever since. Now, the, uh, the equity myth came about in a, in, in a sort of peculiar way. Let me give you just a little background. Uh, my uh, former writing colleague, Carol Tatter, uh, and I uh, pursued studies in racism in various institutions in Canadian society. Uh, we wrote a book on racial profiling, on policing, on media, on arts, um, even on um, the academy. We finally decided to have a look at universities. And the problem there was that racism at the university hadn't even been thought of, much less research. So we only found a handful of scholars who had been interested in this particular uh, issue. But nevertheless, we were able to get a very interesting book together, uh, which raised the, the issue, which raised the problem 
that the university, like any other institution in society, is open to racism. Uh, and just because it's this hallowed place of learning does not mean that it is free of racism, discrimination uh, in ma many different guises against people of color, against indigenous people, against ethnic peoples, uh, you name it. So uh, there are, uh, there are, uh, there's a long history of, of discrimination and racism in academia, which in Canada was not really examined. And this brings us then to the formation of a group of scholars who thought that it would be a good idea to do some actual research rather than, than just accounts and mere speculation on what happens in the academy. And that is the way the equity myth, um, the book that I'm going to briefly talk about came about. Um, and we got together a, a group of scholars, each of whom uh, gave a uh, chapter on an issue regarding racism that was of particular interest to them. Uh, the book was uh, published in 2017, 18. It was very, very well received. It was geared primarily to academic decision makers. That is the administrative structure of the university. And our publisher, the University of British Columbia Press, very wisely decided to send free copies of the book to university administrators. And so it got around and it, it has gotten a lot of reading and hearing and consultation. So what have we found in that book? First of all, we found that there was almost no data and certainly not disaggregated by race data to be found in the university system in Canada or in very few places for that matter. So that meant we had to begin on, by scratch, just to uh, interview people, to do a survey, uh, to do whatever was necessary in order to gather our own material and our own data. And this was, generally speaking, very, very successful. Uh, in the end, we uh, person to person interviewed uh, almost 100 people. Uh, we sent a survey which was um, distributed throughout Canadian universities and uh, had a very high rate of return and so on. So we, the first thing we did was to gather our own data. Well, what did that data show us? What were our findings by looking at our own workplace? First of all, it should be mentioned that most universities have what are called mission statements in which they lay out their sort of uh, ideological um, uh, ways of looking at the world and what they intend to do. These are sort of, um, you know, good work kind of statements, but of course they're only merely words. We also found that many universities had what used to be called race relations offices to begin with, and later became uh, equity and inclusion offices. And these offices still exist, but they are even now small, understaffed, relatively powerless, and have very little authority in in the administrative structure. They're very, very low in the system's hierarchy. Now, more recently, and I'll come to that in a moment, there have been some changes. For example, many universities have now hired senior people into the senior administration, uh, giving them the rank of vice president, for example, or provost 
or assistant provost or advisor to the president. It varies by university. And these are people, very often racialized people, who um, have had not only personal but academic experience. And they are there to advise the administration and the president. Um, to some extent, this is an improvement to what existed before, which was virtually nothing. But on the other hand, we know that the university administration is hierarchical, it's stratified, and equity really doesn't enjoy a high place in the administrative structure. So one has to wonder how much power an equity advisor, no matter their title, really has in terms of promoting awareness and now more particularly change. We found also that there was very little commitment from the top presidential level. And one of the, the, the most important findings in my view is that where there was commitment from the president, the very top, sometimes assisted by a amenable board of governors, those universities were much more ahead in terms of promoting structural change. We found there were antiquated methods of procedure for hiring, for example, for promotion and tenure, um, for creating change in the curriculum and other areas in the university that would benefit racialized faculty and students. So the whole system is a medieval system and it, um, it, it mainly uh, attempts to sort of look at, uh, at, at, at things of, of learning or in general, but not in specific. So one of the first sort of recommendations we had in that book is that structural change in these areas needs to take place. The equity offices that existed are understaffed, one or two people, very little power. Reporting to whom? It's unclear who they reported to and to what effect. But there were lots of equity statements of good wishes, of goodwill, but very little action. Now, the, ba the basic result is that there are small numbers of racialized faculty. It's a bit, bit better now than at the time we gathered the data. But, and there are very few above the level of associate professor. Uh, there are very few full professors who earned um, uh, their status. Uh, in among the racialized and even fewer in, in, in the indigenous academic community. There were very few in leadership positions. Quite a number of, of universities did um, eventually hire racialized people as presidents, some of whom did very, very little work or almost no work at all in the areas of concern we found a desperately unhappy faculty, a, a faculty desperately trying to fit in, in into a curriculum that was not of their making, <clears throat> where the colleagueship was not very um, supreme, where there was no real mentorship, where there is slowness in promotion and tenure. In fact, during our interviews, there are, were people who cried. And some said, in fact, quite a number said that our interview was the first time that they could openly discuss their situation without fear of repercussion. Now, that, that's sort of the general picture. And of course, the book details, presents many, many other details about uh, how the university is basically unfair to, uh, to their um, fairly new faculty and certainly students. Now, uh, a couple of years later, I should certainly point out 
that there is much more attention at the university level. There are, um, there are a number of universities that have set up or established uh, week-long consultations on race and, and indigenous issues in, in, in the um, university. So uh, it is, uh, the University of Toronto is one, the University of British Columbia is another and so on. Um, so, and I'm sure there are probably others. There is an awakening at the university level now. It is the whole issue of racism is now on their agenda. And one can only hope that there will be more attention paid uh, to these issues. But what I want to, um, what I want to uh, close with is the notion that, yes, awareness, being on the agenda, hiring and promoting more people, and doing all of these uh, things is useful and is necessary. But what is really needed in the academy is structural change of a major kind. For example, the curriculum needs overhauling. The curriculum should not be uh, overpowered by learnings from European institutions. So what we really need to push for now, now that there is growing awareness of the issues and that something needs to be done, is a call for action. It is no longer useful to, uh, to uh, sit and complain and, and ask for government help or ask for whoever's help. Uh, it is necessary for universities themselves to not only identify the issue, but make sure that they have and develop structural change to implement real action and change. And of course, this call to action has really been um, promoted by the atmosphere in society almost worldwide by the Black Lives Matter protests. That helped to bring the issue to the public agenda, including to the university. And one can only hope that as the protests die off and as uh, things begin to fall off the agenda, one can only hope that uh, universities will heed the call to action to substantive structural change. So let me conclude on that, on that um, hope. Thank you very much. You want me to go though? Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Francis. I mean, sorry, Francis Henry. Sorry, I got distracted with that comment there. Um, so we'll move on to um, Aaron, uh, Dr. Franks. Thank you, Emery. Uh, thank you, Francis, for those uh, great words. Uh, I, I wanna thank everyone for inviting me uh, to this panel. It's a real honor. Uh, I'm, I'm humbled to be in this company. Uh, and I want to thank Elder Commander for bringing us together uh, in such a good way. And of course, to, to thank Anne-Marie and, and the other organizers. Uh, Anne-Marie introduced me. Uh, I just want to uh, share a tiny bit more about myself. Uh, I'm originally from Edmonton in Treaty 6 territory. Um, my family has roots in the Anglo-Métis communities of Birch Hills in Saskatchewan near Prince Albert and the Red River settlements in Manitoba. And my people come from Anglo-Métis and Cree and English and German and Norwegian and Irish heritage, and I I, I honor them, and I I bring I bring uh, silently bring my family's story, I think, to this to this work tonight here. And I'm joining you tonight from unceded Algonquin territory, like I think more than a few people. And I want to acknowledge the very diverse uh, Indigenous nations and communities and territories that we are all gathered here together online from. So uh, I'll start my talk. Uh, which focuses on the OCAP principles with uh, a description of the organization I work for, the First Nations Information Governance Center. 
Uh, and I do that because, you know, while the OCAP principles are owned collectively and interpreted by First Nations, we as a national organization have uh, been given uh, a national stewardship role uh, over the OCAP, uh, uh, OCAP principles. Uh, so it's important to situate uh, the development of the principles um, there as well. So I'll talk a bit about FNIGC and then I'll talk about OCAP. And I wanna do that um, by using the OCAP lens to, to address indigenous data sovereignty. And, and to do that further, uh, I'm going to draw attention to the legal and institutional and cultural barriers to Indigenous data sovereignty in Canada. Sorry, I'm just setting my timer here a little belatedly. And, uh, and share OCAP as a pragmatic response by First Nations to the, this legacy, uh, this, these barriers. So FNIGC, we are a First Nations not-for-profit organization. We were incorporated in 2010 with a special mandate from the Assembly of First Nations Chiefs and Assembly. And this was a step in a journey from our beginnings uh, as the National Steering Committee of the First Nations Regional Longitudinal Health Survey, which was established in 1996. And I mention this because First Nations developed this survey in response to Statistics Canada's decision then not to engage on reserve populations in the socioeconomic survey work that they were rolling out at that time. So First Nations themselves organized to fill that gap and uh, we continue to do so. And this time also marked the beginning of the OCAP principles. So FNIGC, we are a national service organization that serves First Nations communities through a regional governance structure. So communities come together to do uh, regional work, to gather resources and, and share at the regional level and where it's decided it's appropriate and people choose to do so. FNIGC coordinates work at the, at the national uh, level. So our work is, uh, is obviously very diverse and you know, it, it includes working with First Nations organizations to continue developing this uh, quantitative survey research that's uh, still in the, amongst the only uh, um, indigenous designed and led uh, um, and, and uh, delivered um, quantitative research. Uh, I think globally, um, we now have four distinct national surveys that cover a whole range of subject areas. And that's really grown from the, uh, the original RHS in, in 1996. So with these survey findings, we work with, um, with, uh, with uh, respectful researchers uh, uh, through carefully governed agreements to produce reports and findings when uh, regions agree that we should do so uh, to advance First Nations information needs. And then of course, we also have uh, a line of work in applied research on data sovereignty and information governance. So the really complex field of technology, uh, social practice, uh, uh, the legal environment that, um, that uh, data sovereignty is is advanced in and we do education and awareness raising on the OCAP principles. Our vision is that every First Nation will achieve data sovereignty in, a, in alignment with its own worldview. And our mission is to work with First Nations to assert data sovereignty and to support the development of strong information governance and management relationships at the community level. And as a national organization, we do that by leveraging our partnerships. We adhere to free, prior, and informed consent, and we respect nation-to-nation -nation relationships and the and the uh, original customs and laws of First Nations as they express them themselves. So that's a bit about FNIGC. I want to uh, talk a little bit about what First Nations data is, and the definition that we use really resonates with the international Indigenous data sovereignty movement. So we consider it to be data about our resources like land and water, the environment and medicines and, and data about us, uh, demographic, socioeconomic, health, education, housing, infrastructure, all of the contemporary, I guess you'd say, uh, data sets and, and bodies of information that, uh, that any community or jurisdiction needs uh, to, um, to advance its own governance and the well-being of its own people. And of course, there's data from us, like our languages, our stories, and our cultures. So I wanna now discuss some of the general, and I've kind of grouped them here. It's a really broad overview in the time that I have, the legal and institutional and cultural barriers to First Nations trying to exercise their data sovereignty. 
in Canada. So first, I'm going to talk about a legacy of unethical research and information gathering. So First Nations are asserting data sovereignty where there is a long history of First Nation peoples and communities being subjects of research. And the resultant research literature is written from a colonial perspective and it results in limited representations of First Nations people and often contains stereotypical and damaging depictions of First Nations people uh, from a deficit perspective. And this legacy really has led to broad-based mistrust in research and information sharing with non-First Nations institutions, including, including the academy. And beyond research processes uh, and the research agendas that are often set without First Nations people, there's the continuing legacy of colonial data holding and management. And First Nations data continues to be held and managed by governments and institutions in Canada in a very colonial way. So this includes, for example, the sharing of First Nations data without the consent or knowledge of the community, the, over, the commercialization of First Nations data, the over collection of First Nations data, which I'll touch on a little bit here in a second, and data collected without the intent or the capacity to improve the well being of First Nations. And First Nations data is held by so many non Indigenous organizations and institutions, which of course include universities and academic data repositories. Um, at a broader scale, the, the Government of Canada particularly Indigenous Services Canada, holds over 200 databases of First Nations data. So that includes masses of data on housing, health, education, employment, income, band elections, child welfare, family services, and of course the Indian registry system, which um, for those who aren't familiar with it, actually contains extensive genealogical and biographical information about individuals as well. And all of this data, which is collected from First Nations, has not been effectively used to improve the lives of First Nations people. So in 2018, the Auditor General concluded that Indigenous Services and Employment and Social Development Canada are requiring data from First Nations, but not using it effectively to improve the lives of First Nations people. To, to offer an abridged quote here, they are not measuring and reporting on progress to close socioeconomic gaps. There is a lack of performance indicators to determine if programs are effective. We recommend that First Nations are engaged on decision-making and getting better, more accurate information. Now, this was the fourth time that the Auditor General reported on this problem in, in, uh, in recent years. So, you know, four times the charm, right? It really shows a lack of commitment to uh, improving practice and improving data management and collection practices. And, and uh, beyond that, actually utilizing the data that is collected in a way that's consistent with meeting First Nations self-declared needs. So we have a legacy of unethical and at times even quite harmful research and the continued large scale and inappropriate data collection and retention and another major gulf in the nation to nation relationship regarding uh, data sovereignty. And that's Canada's information and data legal regime. So there are extensive gaps in Canadian legislation and policy that present risks to both personal and community privacy for First Nations. Community privacy is not recognized socially or legally or, or culturally particularly in Canada, certainly not in the legislation. And while there's provision in the legislation for the protection of information that is shared between governments, for example, between a province and Canada or between Canada and another nation state, uh, this same protection does not extend to the information which First Nations share and are often forced to or required to share with the government, which makes that information uh, exposed to public requests for access to information. All right, so with that backdrop, I want to, I want to uh, move on to the OCAP principles themselves. So they were created by First Nations, uh, emerged as a, uh, a practical um, tool with, uh, with those original um, on reserve and community led uh, survey initiatives back in the 90s, really as a practical path to take us beyond this, this uh, triple headed legacy of destructive uh, data collection and, and governance practices. And it was originally coined as OCA, ownership, control and access. And then the, the P for possession, and we'll talk a bit about each principle um, in turn here in a second, was really added uh, as in recognition of the, the really the importance of possession as 
uh, uh, the main tool for being able to exercise your jurisdiction and uh, those ownership rights and uh, maintaining control and access. So a little bit of, inf of information on each principle here, and I, I know I'm addressing a, a really large and varied audience of people, so I hope I'm, I've been pitching this, this uh, information to you uh, right. So the principle of ownership states that a First Nation, a First Nations community, owns its information collectively in the same way that an individual owns their personal information. So even if a community designates a third party, like a university, as a steward of their data, the community retains ownership and all the rights associated with that. So stewardship, um, uh, uh, being designated as a caretaker or a participant in data processes, does not grant ownership rights. Those remain with the community. Control is a little more general, but I think the essence of it is that the aspirations and inherent rights of First Nations to regain and retain control over their lives and institutions, that this extends to data and information as a collectively held resource. So communities and their representative bodies that they designate must control how information about them is collected and used and disclosed. And access has, has two parts really. Of course, a First Nation has to have access to information that it collects about itself, but also information that's collected by other people about, uh, about them. And that, of course, that extends to uh, academic uh, researchers and people in, in universities and similar institutions. It also means that First Nations have to uh, have control over who else has access to that information and under what conditions. This can be through data sharing agreements, research agreements. So that's the double side of, uh, of access. And possession, as I said, is really the ultimate mechanism to exercise the O, C, and the A. Uh, obviously problematic as so much First Nations data is held by other institutions. And I think it's important to recognize that uh, um, in this digital age, um, First Nations not only uh, need to be able to bring information into their possession on their territory, but can also exercise their jurisdiction through other means by extending that outside of their territory into the digital realm. And I just want to wrap up with an observation on the importance of our collective and individual relationship to, uh, to OCAP rights and data sovereignty. So there is a distinction between asserting and respecting OCAP. Only, only First Nations as uh, the owners of the collective rights, which are inherent and constitutionally recognized to their information, only First Nations assert OCAP. It is the role of others in this environment like academics to respect OCAP, and that's through understanding the principles as they're interpreted by communities um, in, in, for example, a, in a research partnership, and understanding that respecting OCAP will often include ceding authority or making space for First Nations to, to exercise their sovereignty over their data and information. I think I've got the timing right on this. I don't want to overstep. Uh, that was my introduction to OCAP and, and Indigenous data sovereignty as it's practiced by First Nations in Canada. Thanks very much. Um, I really look forward to the conversation afterwards and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Aaron. That was wonderful. Um, and so we'll move on to um, Donna. <laughs> Sego, de con Murado, Seguego, Kaharako Sunjats, Dano Waget Nyadu, Dano Gahnawage, Ija Gawenu, Dano Citizen of the Kanyakahaga Nation, Rodinishoni Confederacy. Greetings, my name is Gaharako Stana Goodleaf, and I'm Turtle Clan. And I was born and raised in my community of Kahnawage. And I'm a citizen of the Kanyakahaga Nation, which means people of the Flint. And it's part of the uh, Haudenosaunee Confederacy or commonly known to the world community as the Haudenosaunee Six Nations Iroquois Confederacy. Um, I wanted to first uh, begin to acknowledge and uh, say Nyawakoa, uh, uh, Claudette, for your, um, your opening words, your welcoming words in your language. And, uh, and I extend to you my greetings and thanksgiving to you. Um, 
the way we would do um, as two peoples. And so I wish to honor you and, and, and to acknowledge and, and to give thanksgiving to you for those words. Secondly, I wanna thank all the, um, uh, uh, Anne and all the people here that have organized this event. Uh, I'm thankful for the invitation to sit here with you and to have a conversation with everybody to talk about decolonizing <clears throat> and anti-racism in, in academic institutions. And <clears throat> I, I, I'm going to uh, just share with you within the short time frame that I have uh, about the work I do at Concordia University. Uh, first and foremost, for me, when I think about decolonization or decolonizing, it's a protracted struggle. It's a lifelong process. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an action-oriented uh, process whereby for me, what it means for indigenous peoples is the return of our stolen lands. Um, and uh, so that is first and foremost, uh, primary principle around uh, decolonization. And so when I think about academic institutions as sites, colonial sites, uh, educational sites that are sitting upon uh, indigenous lands right across Turtle Island, um, that's, uh, you know, every academic institution has to really um, reflect on itself and look at its colonial history uh, and its origins of its institutions and, and how they have and continue to do, um, like residential schools, perpetuate uh, Eurocentric, um, you know, right supremacist canons of thoughts right across the board in all academic disciplines. And, and so if we're talking about decolonizing the academy, the institutions have a fundamental and ethical responsibility to really look at itself and to really uh, critique the structures and the policies and practices that have been set up and are in place to uh, privilege um, uh, uh, Eurocentric um, canons of thought, uh, your power and uh, racism, institutional racism. And uh, while it has and continue to deny the uh, existence of the diversity of indigenous uh, nations, uh, voices, histories, lived experiences um, in the curriculum. So, uh, I started at Concordia in 2018, and I came in working for the Center for Teaching and Learning and um, as the Indigenous Curriculum and Pedagogical Advisor, and then uh, changed my uh, title to Director of Decolonizing Curriculum and Pedagogy. And uh, my main role is to work with all academic institutions, uh, all faculty, across the academic university to work with departments and faculty to begin the process of, of uh, critiquing uh, their curriculum and looking at ways of how it, uh, we need to look at it, critique it, and then um, redefine it, realign it in ways that center uh, indigenous voices and perspectives and lived experiences um, throughout the curriculum. And not done in a tokenistic way, but done through a very comprehensive way. So, um, but before I get into that, I wanted to just talk about what, uh, when I came to Concordia a couple of years ago, there was already uh, a group of indigenous faculty, students and staff and some allies at Concordia who were in the process of uh, developing and putting together Concordia's um, Indigenous Directions Action Plan. And it's an action plan that has uh, been collectively put together and written. Uh, and it lays out six mandate areas uh, directions for the University of Concordia to begin to look at uh, of uh, how 
uh, and um, action items that will bring Concordia to a place of, of beginning to decolonize all their institutional structures and policies and practices, including curriculum. So the six mandate areas, we look at indigenous students. So looking at different programs and, and services that uh, can uh, empower our students. And we, we look at curriculum and pedagogy and that's my particular work that I do. We look at uh, indigenous, uh, the hiring of indigenous faculty and, uh, and staff. Um, we look at uh, governance and relationship to Indigenous communities. Um, we look at uh, also institutional environment. So it's critiquing all the uh, uh, all the different institutional um, units that are in Concordia, and identifying all these different areas that have policies and practices in place that have. Uh, contributed to um, the the racism, institutional racism, uh, and discrimination uh, uh, behaviors that Indigenous faculty, students, and staff have experienced at Concordia. So we launched that in two uh, in two thousand in April two thousand and nineteen, uh, and so. We're just in the process of uh, reviewing that because it's a living document. It's a document not to be like, like what government does. You know, they create these documents and then they sit on the shelf. But to, for us as the Indigenous Directions Leadership Council, uh, we have a council that's consisted of Indigenous faculty, students and staff, and we meet on a monthly basis. And there we review the action plan and we uh, decide what are the priorities that we're going to take on each year. And uh, we work with different components in the university to begin to uh, examine and look at uh, what are the uh, current uh, policies and practice that are in place that have contributed to the uh, systemic racism that uh, Indigenous students and faculty have been experiencing. So the work that I do uh, is uh, pretty, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting challenge. I, I, I love the work, you know, mind you, it's only me, you know, and trying to work with the whole university system, uh, dealing with curriculum, <laughs> dealing with faculty is quite a challenge. And so, um, you know, it, it's, I, I, I need a team of people. Uh, but right now, uh, how I've been working is that I've been working with the different uh, departments and also working with individual faculty from all over um, and meeting with them. And um, the process I, I go through with them is uh, getting them to have a conversation. We have a conversation when we meet. And the first thing I do is getting them to talk about their own educational experiences, because the first thing when you're talking about decolonizing the curriculum, you know, it's not just an abstract notion. And it's not just looking at your course outline, but it has to begin with you as the individual, as faculty. Because to me, it's really important to cultivate a critical consciousness of people. We need faculty to change their way of thinking, how they behave and how they relate with indigenous people. So the first process I go through them is getting them to share with me. And I tell them that I'm not making this comfortable for them, that this is gonna be hard work and uh, it's gonna be unsettling and you have to be able to do the work. Uh, but it's getting them to share their stories about their own educational experiences and how their educational experiences have shaped and informed their attitudes, their perceptions, the stereotypes that they've had about Indigenous peoples, and how has that played into the construction of their course syllabuses and how they teach and how they relate with students, Indigenous students in the classroom. It's, it's, it's a very powerful uh, dynamic. And so 
I get them to go through that process first is getting them to really engage at a deeper level about you know, self-critical self-reflection about their lived experiences and how that they're bringing that into the classroom. So then we, uh, we pull together, uh, we look at, for myself, a strategy I've been using is looking at the department's curriculum and looking at what are the core courses that students, all incoming students have to take and then what are the core courses that they have to take when they exit. And from there, identifying what those core courses are and sitting with a committee of uh, the chair and faculty and exploring and paring down each course syllabus, critiquing the language in the course description, critiquing um, all the topics that are outlined in the 12, 13 weeks, critiquing the, uh, the resources that they're using each week that they're, they're having students read and what they're discovering that is that they are complicit in perpetuating Western theoretical frameworks. And there's no, there's no articles written by indigenous scholars. There's no, there's no discussion or a, or a connection about the colonization of, and its impact on indigenous peoples as, the, as, a, as a central framework. So it's getting them to really examine the foundational assumptions of how they designed their curriculum, what are the principles that it's based on, what's the framework they're using, and then getting them to recenter and realign and, and integrate Indigenous perspectives uh, throughout the whole course outline. And, and then also getting them to localize their curriculum. Uh, so uh, I give them resources and tools that they need to really uh, visually see where we are as, as Haudenosaunee people. Uh, so there's maps that I use. Um, and then there's uh, resources that they use where they can learn about the local history and integrate that into their curriculum. Um, <laughs> so it's a it's a it's a process like that. And but it's it, it's 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 in dialogue, it's in conversations, and it's work. And uh, so what I've been doing is. Uh, you know, I've been getting, I, I've been working with faculty in engineering, faculty in media and communications. I've had some faculty from, from film studies, education, different departments. Uh, engineering is, has been really interesting. I never thought, you know, um, you know, I thought that would be a hard uh, wall to crack, but uh, it, it's been really great experience because there's been some really good faculty that are are on board and wanting to really be committed to decolonizing their curriculum. So we now have a curriculum on decolonizing the stems. And so what I do is I get people, I get faculty to look at, um, you know, so for example, territorial land acknowledgements, everybody's doing that. Everybody's doing that. It's become a new trend. And so when I talk about territorial land acknowledgements, you know, it didn't just start in recent years. Before European colonization ever happened, indigenous peoples in Turtle Island, we have been doing our own ancient um, acknowledgements to each other whenever we enter into another nation's territory. So we have all of ceremonial language. We have all those protocols that have always been in place when we're meeting with other indigenous nations. And so when I explain to faculty, you know, how do you take a university's territorial land acknowledgement and how do you bring life into it? Because right now people are just putting it on their core syllabus and it stays as, a, as an abstract description where they're not connecting it to the topic of the course that they're teaching and not weaving it in throughout the whole course outline. So. So there, what I do is I work with them and give them the tools and strategies to uh, uh, create learning activities uh, with students. And I tell them that on the first day of your, of your course that you, you, know, you talk about the territorial land acknowledgement 
And you share with your students, you know, be vulnerable and you share with your students that, you know, that you're not an expert on, on, on our history, but you're sharing it because it's important to talk about this and bring it into life, into your curriculum. And you, and you relate it to the current land rights struggles that are currently going on across Turtle Island. What's happening in Ganasadage? It's happening again. You know, what's happening with the land rights struggles in Caledonia? It's happening. What's happening with the Wissowatan people? You know, with the, with the pipeline uh, situation, there's current land rights struggles going on. And, and how do you integrate that into your curriculum? Uh, so I give them the tools that they need to kind of make those changes and, and, and uh, develop questions where you have students engage with themselves and getting them to position themselves about where they're at, whose land are they sitting on and living and working on, and what's their relationship to us. So it's about not objectifying us, but it's about subjecting yourself bringing yourself in this and not being a part of it and it's uncomfortable you know but you know there's there's no such thing as it being comfortable you know welcome to my world of being of being of struggling you know so so that's some of the uh the uh the ways that i've been working with faculty and another way has been um looking at like for example in engineering you know, getting uh, faculty, when you're teaching any topics around engineering and, and, and all these different scientists who developed all these technologies, well, wait a minute, you know, we have a whole history, you know, of our own brilliance as in indigenous engineers, as architectures way before colonization happened. You know, if you look at the diversity of indigenous peoples, our architecture, how we, how we lived and how we continue to live and the, the, the different structures, you know, the, the brilliant development of different irrigation water systems in South America, you know, it's grounding students in that indigenous history, that knowledge base as the foundational knowledge, then get them to learn all these different theoretical perspectives, bring that into play. And it's a way to kind of decenter Eurocentric theories. You know, it, it's a way of decentering and 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 undermining, uh, you know, uh, you know the uh, the the belief that you know white supremacy is this one superior, uh, be the only way of knowing. And it's not. You know, it's about critiquing those knowledge systems, and it's about a way of bringing the, uh, the different uh, indigenous perspectives into play and making that the core foundational basis of your curriculum. Then building it in where you're bringing in other um, in the, uh, other perspectives, the theoretical perspectives. In that way, you're you're enriching students' um, uh, learning experiences. You know, they're, you're, you're enriching their thinking and how they're forming new ways of thinking, you know, as opposed to a very limited, a controlled way of just focusing in all the Western theories around engineering, around literature, around education, I can, all the different disciplines. So the strategy, the way I look at it is that every single uh, academic department that has been created and it's been you know and when you look at it it's it's in silos right so knowledge is in silos and 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 how do you break that down how do you come from a place of of integrating all the different knowledges it's it's totally you know it's it's uh it's you have to break those structures because it's shaping how people are thinking and how people are learning you know, when I teach, I don't just, you know, teach about history. I there's education, there's economics, there's different, there's language, there's different, you know, I bring everything in. It's creating an integrative holistic framework of how you're looking at the world. And that's the difference with indigenous peoples and in our worldview and how we see the world. And it's grounded in our languages. So, uh, in, in our languages, you know, um, Claudette, you, you said it earlier, you know, that's another thing is how do you break down those walls? 
you know, uh, you know, the government right now, they, you know, you have way before colonization, you had diversity of indigenous languages existing and they're still existing today. And so how did it come to be where you have, you know, uh, colonial languages such as English and French, and I don't mean to offend people, but these are colonial languages. And how does it that they become to be the official language of, this, of, of, of uh, Turtle Island while denying and erasing and making invisible uh, indigenous languages? So, you know, you have to really think about that. What are you, what is it gonna take to change the thinking, the structures in, in, in institutions that have been set up to maintain the power and privilege of white supremacy? And how are you going to change that in ways that you know, uh, realign people's thinking and action? So, for, so, so the work I do is not only getting faculty to think about these things, change their thinking, but it also, it means action. So how are you going to implement it? How are you going to change your thinking? You know, so it's, uh, you know, I, it, it, it's, a, it's an interesting, interesting um, process that I, I, I use and that I, I, I come from and, and what I use and, and how I relate with faculty. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's a, it's, I, I don't have a, the perfect solution, but I think it's an organic process that I've just been able to let it evolve. And, and it's, you know, it's been quite interesting, you know, and, and I, and I'm hearing feedback from faculty who have changed their, you know, it's impacted them, it's changed them and then how they're teaching and how they're relating with students and students are loving it because I'll tell you something, students are hungry for wanting to know about indigenous history. And as faculty, we have the ethical responsibilities. You have the ethical responsibilities to make sure that you, you sit back and you think about how you've been teaching, what you've been teaching, and what is it that you need to do to make those changes and open up those spaces that allow, uh, that um, elevate, you know, that recenter our voices and perspectives in every single academic um, department program. So, uh, I, I'll, I'll stop there and, and I'll, I, I'm, you know, I'll wait till we have the, the, you know, the question and answer period and hopefully have a, a really good conversation about this. Yeah, well. Uh, I don't want to speak long, but I just want to say that was uh, incredible, um, Donna. And uh, so thank you so much. I just feel like we've had a mini course, <laughs> you know, all from you and, uh, and also a call to action. So thank you. I have no words. Thank you so much. Um, so we'll move to uh, Dr. Melinda Smith. Good evening and thank you. Uh, I, I want to begin by uh, noting that I'm speaking to you from the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta. And the city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. I say this to say, to acknowledge that the lands remain contested and our institutions and our practices and our symbols and rituals are in our universities remain uh, in conversation about how they may be decolonized. And I said that because unsettling though it may be, we study, we teach, we learn, research and engage in social justice in spaces that are haunted by dispossession. I wanna thank uh, Elder Claudette Commander for opening the meeting in a good way and I want to thank uh, Anne-Marie and, and Peter and uh, Balarama and all of those who organized the sessions. And I want to thank my co-presenters. 
Part of the context of this discussion around anti-racism and decolonization in academia uh, emerges out of the context of, the, of racial, of recent context of racial violence. We are witnessing, uh, not, um, they are not new. Um, what is new though, I, I would say, is that they are caught on video, on iPhones, uh, um, on cell phones, I should say. Um, and then, or their live streams uh, where people witness the death or the life seeping out of uh, um, George Floyd as a police officer's uh, knee uh, pressed down on his neck, or um, Joyce Eshawan in the Quebec hospital as uh, slurs are uh, uh, hurled at her in her last moment. But also the many instances of anti-Black racial profiling on campuses. Uh, but the broader society too, in which we are witnessing just the resurgence and the intensification of Islamophobia and anti-immigrant set sentiments. So the context is actually one fraught by deep structural racism, but also by uh, 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 leaders and in institutions claiming they don't understand systemic racism or that systemic racism doesn't exist. So there's this continuing denial of racism. In our universities, and I'm now in a university in an equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, portfolio, we have issued a number of statements um, and some noted, uh, you know, reluctantly, I would say anti-Black racism. Some were silent on anti-Black racism. Others name anti-Indigenous racism and some name anti-Asian racism and then the intensification of anti-Asian racism in the context of COVID-19, what some have called COVID racisms that impact um, Asian, uh, diverse Asians, so Asians, Chinese, Filipino communities. But I also wanna say um, that the context, and I think I'm already alluded to this, um, highlight the ways in which anti-racism and decolonization work tends to be separated in our universities. Um, they are separate tracks in the same way that EDI and indigenization are separate tracks. And we have, we have, we have yet to, these are developing in silos, we have yet to think these thoughts in tandem. What would our university look like if we took decolonization seriously? What would our universities look like if we took indigenization seriously? What would our universities look like if we took anti-racism seriously? I asked that question because we have been, universities in Canada have been asking those questions with a plethora of anti-racism of anti task force in the from the 1990s onward. Some universities have had these task force, the, the reports have been filed, uh, uh, others, um, others have led to EDI offices. Many of the EDI offices emerged then in turn focused on gender equity and few, even today in this moment, have anti-racism initiatives. Few have anti-racism policies. But also what we have seen though, is some gestures towards transforming universities. I would still say these are in silos. And I would stress that the initiatives we are seeing say around anti-black racism, for example, across universities in Canada, these aren't emerging out from higher up. They are the result of struggle and they are the result of advocacy by black students associations, by black professors, uh, by black faculty staff and student uh, caucuses. So, it's, so what we're seeing and, 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 and these, I should say that these black students associations, we see initiatives even in, in, in the professions, law and medicine for example, around initiatives around the curriculum and admissions processes. We see black faculties and caucuses calling for uh, more hirings, cluster hirings and, and, and more um, black studies programs. And so I wanna highlight seven of these. I, want, I think these are replicated across Canadian universities, but I'm not persuaded that without further transformation activities that they will be more than additive rather than transformative. So you see initiatives around admissions, particularly in medical schools and law schools. Um, so, or, or you can think of, of, of transition programs uh, for, for black and indigenous students as well. 
you see the emergence of certificates, minors, and degree programs in Black studies. These are important because they say now that students are not, are not just objects of knowledge, but that they are actually constituting knowledges. Whether they are co-constituting knowledges will depend on whether they are Black faculty. Third is we see the push for cluster hires or targeted hires. Um, some universities are hiring a few, some are hiring more significant numbers. But again, the question is how sustainable these initiatives are and whether in fact, in many of the disciplines, even if you're hiring 60 and 20 people, black professors will still be experiencing a situation of one or, or being the only, seen as indigenous people. And it begs the question, if you are one or the only, how can we talk about decolonizing the university without non-Western people and indigenous peoples in it? So what are we decolonizing? And how are we decolonizing? And again, it begs the question, if we took decolonization seriously, if we took anti-racism seriously, what would our university look like? And I would say some other initiatives that I think are worthy of thinking about, which is to say they are Black Studies chairs, Canada Research Chairs, but institutional chairs, we see this at York, Queens, just recently announced too, I think today. We see postdocs, again, trying to fuel new generations of scholars, new scholars. We see this at U of T and McGill, for example, the emerging scholars the initiatives focusing on black and indigenous scholars. And then we see a whole uh, series of uh, panels and task force on, for example, on slavery, led by Afua Cooper at Dalhousie University, but similar, but a, a, another gesture at McGill University, Ryerson discussions about uh, uh, the name Ryerson. Would these highlight whether Lord Dalhousie or James McGill or Ryerson is that even the names of our institution reflect this colonial, this slave and colonial history which are often hidden or submerged. So we are actually studying in places that are saturated by the coloniality of, uh, 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 of Canada, even as we are talking about decolonizing. So those names and symbols, not just of sports teams, but of our rituals and our practices also require us thinking more deeply about anti-racism and decolonization. So as again, I said, these initiatives that we are seeing emerge out of the context of self-help and struggle led and mobilized by indigenous and racialized students in large part, but also by faculty. But there's a larger, more fundamental history. And I want us to, 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 to focus on this. The idea that anti-racism and decolonization could be separated uh, misunderstands the long durée of the, the anti-colonial struggle, which was inextricably connected to anti-racism, to challenging not just Eurocentrism, but also structural whiteness. So when we think of the work of Amy César, for example, or Franz Fanon, or Albert Memmi, or the whole the, the, the uh, decolonial school, or the indigenous fought, uh, fought world globalist critique, these were all connecting anti-racism and decolonization. And the waves of decolonization, in, in, in whether in Africa or Asia or Latin America or in the, in the, in the Portuguese colonies, all connected uh, the structures, the political economy of, of, of colonialism and to the universities and led to discussions about is, is Africanizing the curriculum the same as decolonizing the curriculum? In the same way that we're asking questions about is indigenizing the curriculum the same as decolonizing the curriculum? But the, the, it, the struggles in the UN also were connected to anti-Black racism. We have an international day for the elimination of racial discrimination precisely because of the anti-colonial, I mean, the anti-apartheid struggles and the, the impact on school children being shot by police. All those decades later, we are still having school children being shot by police. So what have we learned? But prior to the mobilization, then we also had Black Lives Matter, we had I'll No More, we had this mobilizations around indigenous um, uh, um, um, uh, 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 women. Um, 
And collectively and individually, they, high, they highlight the need for structural change. So I wanna just make, in the few minutes left to me, I wanna make a, 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 a several other points, okay? So there has always been an intersection of anti-racism and decolonization. The universities have been remarkable in keeping them separate and siloed. And we actually are now seeing a conversation to return to them. I wanna say that these conversations are, more, are, are informed by students. And, and I think it's an uh, ode to the, the insurgent struggles of black and indigenous students who are in the heart of empire and who are now forming a more critical mass within our institutions themselves. They are challenging the political, economic, epistemic and sim symbolic violences that they experience in, in, in universities from South Africa uh, to Rhodes Must Fall to Oriel College in Oxford to discussions about why is my curriculum so white. So the, connect to the, the university struggles in Canada are also connected to these global structural struggles to decolonize the curriculum worldwide. Secondly, we are seeing in universities the emergence of a number of study groups around and our scholarly associations around decolonizing. So whether it's the colonial, post-colonial, decolonial working group in the British Studies Association, the decolonial group in Berlin, the broader decolonial network in Europe, or the kind of decolonial group you see on YouTube, or the, or the multilingual decolonial translation groups, all of these are, are, are pressing our universities to think differently. Third, um, the, the, my thinking on decolonizing colonizing university draws on what Ross Fugel refers to as the westernized university. And I actually think this is important. So yes, we're talking about decolonizing the curriculum or even indigenizing the curriculum or even internationalizing the curriculum or globalizing the curriculum. But what we must remember is that the westernized university is part of the European colonial expansion and contemporary global, uh, our global present. So the, the universities are implicated in this global power. I can speak more to this, but we can see this in the ways in which anthropologists and sociologists are embedded in, 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 in war, or we can think about the ways in which physicians and psychologists are embedded in, in, in acts of torture. We can go on. But I, I want to end by saying um, uh, uh, where the, uh, that decolonizing the university must de 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 entail looking at our disciplines, the ways in which we are disciplined into our disciplines. The ways in which un the university, the, the university that we live in and, and work in uh, function to diffuse Eurocentrism, to produce Western and non-West, to produce Western and non-Western elites, to cultivate native informants or compradors. That this Western, Westernized university um, is constitutive of the global power uh, with, uh, consistent with Edward Said's argument about culture and imperialism. Secondly, the westernized university promotes a kind of Eurocentric fundamentalism, as Gross Fugel puts it, which highlights the disciplinary canons. I think we cannot get away from this. It doesn't matter that the social scientific theories that the, uh, in the humanities and social sciences in particular are indistinguishable, whether you're in Montreal, whether you are in Rio de Janeiro, whether you are in Johannesburg, Montreal, Edmonton. The foundation is built on and the thinkers originate from five or six countries in Europe. I call it the theory of the 6%, right? So what it's, uh, and even post-colonial theory relies primarily not on indigenous scholarship, not on non-Western non scholarships, begging the question, can non-Western people think? And if they can think, why aren't we relying on their scholarship? And we can see this reflected in our papers that we publish, in, the, in our citational practices and so on. So in, in our syllabi and so on. So for me, as I said, the intersections of anti-racism decolonization require us to look at the very constitution of the university and to try to think and imagine a university otherwise. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So we are going to start our discussion uh, segment right now. We're going to start our discussion section. We have less than 20 minutes, so please uh, uh, keep your comments to 2 minutes maximum. We have less than 20 minutes, so please keep your comments to 2 minutes maximum.
20 minutes for this uh, session. So we're going to start with our first guest. And our first guest's name is Pierre-Jean Alaco. And Pierre uh, wants to speak to us about achieving integration of elders in program. So Pierre, if you can raise your hand up. Si tu veux lever la main, parce qu'on peut ajouter aux panelistes. So raise your hand so we, okay, there you are. So can someone add him to the panel so he can speak? Do we add Pierre Jean to the panelists? Unmute now. Okay, you should hear me now, right? Perfect. We can hear you, Pierre. Excellent. Okay, uh, two minutes. So I'm going to be quick. Believe me, this is a challenge for me. Uh, I'm just going to read my question uh, right away. I have two, really. Um, to decolonize institution, uh, decolonization would start with recognizing the valued knowledge of elders. Um, in indigenous uh, communities. Uh, in the way academics would put it, their credentials. Most universities will argue that, and I've heard it, uh, governments, uh, various education ministers will say that there are standards in order for us to certify that you're giving a program, bachelor and otherwise, mm -hmm. and uh, there is no place yet for such knowledge. How do we go about um, achieving this integration of, of elders, uh, I want to say storytelling in our programs. Our panelists. Do I have to choose a panelist? Uh, the panelists will, anyone want to pick the question yeah. or want to talk? I'll, I'll take a shot at that. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll share my uh, experience at Concordia. There's been times when um, I've sat in meetings uh, with uh, different departments and wanting to bring in an elder to come and do the um, territorial land acknowledgement. Uh, for a conference, and uh, and then that was it. And so, my position is that you know it's uh, it's a very uh, you know that's a very difficult situation because when I look at the elders in my community today, you know um, it, it's hard you know to bring them into the university, and then uh, and then when you bring them into the classroom you know, and you have them talk, um, you know, what's the, what's your, what are you going to give back to them? Mm -hmm. um, and also, uh, I'm very protective of, of the elders in my community because of the, um, you know, just using them uh, to, you know, to bring them into the classroom and then that's it. Or, or to just do a territorial land acknowledgement, which is not their role. Um, and, and then we're dis they're discarded on the side. And I think that, uh, you know, when you look at wanting to um, bring in uh, elders into your classroom, I would highly recommend that you make sure that you are working with uh, uh, indigenous peoples from that particular community. Uh, who can assist with that and and to say whether you know it's it's okay mm -hmm. because uh, you have to remember that uh, when they're you know you're asking them to leave their community and travel into a university and uh, uh, you know and and then you know what are you, you know, what are you giving back to them? How are you honoring them? What are you, you know, what are you doing? And then what do you, you know, what's the, what's the purpose of it? So um, I guess I'm just very, I'm very protective in that way. And uh, it all depends on, on the approach of your, of how you're going to uh, do that. Mm -hmm. And you have to really make sure that you have already established uh, 
a trustful relationship with the local community, you know, and then, you know, uh, and find out what are the protocols there and to see if it's even um, doable for that. But you have to be really, really um, know what your place is and, and, and know the local community that, uh, that, you know, you want to bring an elder in from and is it doable? And, uh, you know, and, and, but first have that conversation with the community themselves. Uh, for myself, I'm just very, very protective of our elders. Right. Yeah. Does anybody else want to comment or we can move on to the next question? Okay, we can move on to the next question. The next question is from Jacinthe Poisson and she wants to speak to us about OCAP principles and influencing stats, so this, stats kin's practices. So uh, Jacin, if you can raise your hand so we can promote you to panelists. Okay, I guess uh, Jason does not want to speak. Alors, on va aller à notre prochaine invitée, c'est Daniela. Et Daniela veut parler de antiracisme au milieu. Uh, Daniela wants to talk about anti-racism in the uh, academic milieu. Daniela? Daniela, can someone add Daniela to panelists? Est-ce qu'on peut uh, ajouter Daniela aux membres du panel? Super, oui, parfait, merci. Can, can you hear me? So I'm very yes. So, so I, as I have only two minutes, I'll go straight to the point. I work uh, at the office of the president of the University of Ottawa in anti-racism, and I recently developed an action plan, uh, anti-racism. And I would like to share it with share with you the primary uh, concrete themes upon which uh, I've been uh, working at the university, and, uh, and uh, maybe have, uh, find other people who have uh, similar work. The first point I would like to come to at the University of Ottawa is the system of scholarships. We want to review the whole scholarship system to see if there wouldn't be um, uh, any. Uh, prejudices in the way that the scholarships are attributed um, that, so that students who need the scholarships do not get them. Uh, we also work on the presence of the police on the campus because uh, a student was har harassed last year on campus and it's clear that right now uh, the University of Ottawa does not want to have uh, um, uh, that sort of thing on the campus. We also work on the reduction of the mental exchanges between professors and um, a racialized uh, uh, black and um, indigenous people. I'm one, and um, not the correction, but the psychotherapy. So it's very heavy on me. Uh, it's, it's not a task that's recognized. It's not re uh, remunerated. But when I saw this, I wanted to complain to the processor. We also work on um, the inter international students. Uh, uh, so there are two situations when they're admitted for a master's or, or a PhD. On the one hand, their their marks are are re reduced often if they have a French a diploma. If they if 15 out of 20 is recognized as excellent in France, but in Ottawa, when you make the conversion, it's a, like a B plus, so you don't have an access to an admissions uh, scholarship. And when you are eligible to, uh, for that, because you have the marks for it you realize that the scholarships are very minimal. So there are very few uh, student bursaries. Uh, so, so there's a fight to get them. And uh, right now uh, you have to push to uh, have a foreign um, um, degrees recognized and, and we should have more scholarships for those students. Uh, we also work on uh, decolonization. One of the colleagues talked about that the syllabus is very Eurocentric and we would like to have uh, 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 obligatory courses on anti-racism regardless of the level of studies in which one is and those courses would be how would i say would be based on the programs for example an anti-racist uh, course in, in medicine would explore the issues uh, dealing with uh, racism in the medical milieu and we also want to hire um, 
uh, racialized people because it's a flagrant. Uh, um, um, there, there's no black woman full-time professor at University of Ottawa, and uh, black professors in Ottawa uh, in Canada represent only two percent of the profes profession. And we'd like to work on uh, feasibility studies, which would uh, make it possible for all those plans uh, to be uh, rooted in this scholarly system itself. Uh, we would like to hire a vice provost in equity, and. Uh, that person could have a role that would be more sustained and uh, would have more authority. And also we would think about financing the um, anti-racism uh, um, groups and students because often that work is done f for free without any remuneration. And I think that uh, uh, for students, it would be good to, um, to, to have some remuneration for that. If I have the time, I would just have a, a question for the panelists. Yes? Uh, this, the question that I had was, as an assistant in uh, teaching, we have uh, the international students who arrive with maybe uh, uh, mental health conditions that uh, make it uh, impossible to study full time. So the university um, uh, allows them to, to uh, remain registered at a part time, but they remain full time in order to be allowed to remain at the university. But the problem expressed by those students is the government of Canada. So when the government realizes that they're at part time, they can no longer remain in the country. So what I ask is, to what extent does the uh, federal anti-racism committee uh, have the ability to intervene in that sort of thing? So he, she just asked uh, about international students and for students who are staying in Canada, but at, at, uh, on a part-time basis, the university allows them to stay on a part-time basis, but the government of Canada does not. If they study on a part-time basis, then they have to leave the country. So the question is, what is the anti-racism <laughs> secretariat doing about this? So what uh, should we, do you have an answer for that? So we're going to we're going to let the uh, we're going to continue the conversation with our panelists and in the conclusion we'll uh, we will address the question perfect okay so let's move on to the next um to the next question does anyone want to comment on what Daniela just said no okay well let's move on to the next one we have one from Claudia and Claudia would like to speak uh to ask a question about indigenous engagement in research and co-development. And this question is actually addressed to Aaron. So Claudia, if you can raise your hand up so we can get you to um, be promoted. Hi, Claudia. You're mute. Perfect. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, thank you so much um, for the opportunity to ask the question and as well for the panelists to take part in this important discussion and sharing their knowledge. Um, I had a question initially for Aaron, but hopefully anybody else can answer. Um, so my first question was regarding how can researchers better engage uh, with community members when they conduct research in Indigenous communities in particular? And the second question was regarding how, what are your perspectives or your thoughts on how government departments, specifically Indigenous Services Canada, um, can better co-develop with Indigenous community members um, to make sure that the data is collected in a way that's respectful for communities. Thank you. Well, thank you for the, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take a first uh, crack at, the, at that. I'll, maybe I'll focus on your first question, Claudia. I, I, I think, and I, I'm going to bring, and it may seem like a sort of institutional kind of perspective from FNIGC's um, uh, vantage point and you know looking at this through the lens of the of the OCAP principles um, it, you, I, I think 
you're 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 kind of you know getting at when you when you mention engagement. I, I guess it, it really begs the question, you know, at at what point in let's say your research process or a person's research process are you thinking about this engagement beginning? And what is it about the research question or your research that you feel needs to be done? Um, and I don't, you know, I, I, uh, I, uh, I can't uh, extract the situation exactly from your question, but I, I think it's, it's safe to say that very, very often there's an assumption that uh, a research question needs to be addressed and, and engaged in, and then you go seeking, the, the question goes seeking the problem. And that's research that's not responding to a community's self-determined research agenda. So I guess there's that. There's the notion of uh, why, why begin the engagement and on what grounds. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess further beyond that, you know, there's, there's, there's a, it's a bit of a false distinction, but I think it's, it's, it can be useful. The distinction maybe between ethics as uh, a Western institution might understand it, um, as, uh, you know, a minimum baseline to do no harm. And, you know, there's a, there's a real genealogy to the Western institutional approach to ethics. Uh, it comes from a sort of um, uh, biomedical perspective and it's attached to the atrocities that uh, the, the Nazis uh, performed on people during the Second World War and, and you know, the allied countries, uh, uh, the victors of that war, uh, putting together a system of, of ethics that was based on, you know, certain, certain biomedical principles and legal principles so there's an ethical approach to research that um, seeks a kind of minimal, uh, minimal uh, damage mitigation and, and hence a kind of maybe minimal amount of engagement. There's ethics in a broader sense that's about transparency and mutual benefit and good communication. And I, I guess there's another dimension too that, that's about the, um, the, the, the agency of people involved to determine how the research is gonna happen and even determining why that question's being asked and who it's being asked of. And, and I guess, you know, in some ways, uh, this is not to focus on OCAP, but the, 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 the lens of um, community agency and self-determination is one that I think kind of goes, uh, it puts a special, it puts, it, it puts a, it shines a special light on the notion of engagement. So there's, there's the ethical perspective, the communicative perspective, and then there's the, the, the perspective of agency. So I guess, um, I guess I'd say it's important to reflect on all three of those things when you're entering into a relationship, uh, a research relationship with, with um, with an indigenous community. Can I jump into that as well? Of course. Uh, I, I just want to make a, sing, a simple comment that um, my original discipline is social anthropology. Anthropology has created an entire discipline based upon doing research on peoples who are in some ways different, usually culturally different. And uh, the discipline has in recent years organized its entrance into communities into a much more ethical and value oriented way uh, as uh, the previous speaker has suggested. Um, Anthropology has a compendium of, of ways in which an entree and a relationship can be established in order to uh, secure information, but with the uh, adviso that one should never tamper with or interfere with or harm in any shape or form the people who are being researched. 
So um, if you're thinking of doing research in a community that is not your own, my recommendation would be is to grab a couple of basic texts in social anthropology and uh, learn how some professionals have done this. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Francis, and thank you, Aaron. So this is the end of our virtual uh, town hall assembly. So so semen à la fin de notre assemblée virtuelle. Uh, we're gonna have a couple words of goodbye and thank you by our co-hosts. So uh, quelques mots de clôture par notre nos co-hosts uh, ce soir. Thank you to both of our co-hosts tonight, and we're going to start with Anne Marie. <laughs> Okay, well, I'd just like to thank everybody, uh, participants included, uh, for being part of this uh, much needed conversation. And uh, I think I certainly have gained a lot of insights and, you know, and what I love about the presentations is that they, they, they took us into kind of principles and philosophies, as well as everyday practice. And uh, so I, I thank them um, for that and, 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 and wish everybody a good evening. <laughs> thank you very much, Anne-Marie. And I'd, I'd like to thank Francis Henry, uh, Aaron Franks, uh, Donna Goldleaf and Melinda Smith for your absolutely fascinating, really important contribution tonight. And thanking all the participants for uh, for being and staying with us for this very vital and uh, important uh, conversation. Uh, il faut savoir que c'est simplement le début. Je sais qu'il y a plusieurs personnes. You know that this is only the beginning. I know many people still have a lot of questions. Uh, but we will be hosting another event uh, uh, on research and. I'm sorry, the interpreter cannot hear. Help to, uh, to, to, to shape uh, the next event, the next conversation uh, taking place. So very much, I'd like to thank uh, Anne Marie, Pascal, and of course um, Balarama for for joining us and having the the audacity, if I can say, to to push us and and encourage us to host this really important, vital uh, uh, gathering. Uh, we will be using every every information that we've uh, that we've received to advance our work, which is working across government uh, to uh, remove systemic barriers, um, identify gaps, and really uh, create new and responsive initiatives with departments. And, and we will be uh, looking at the question of regarding the question of Our going to be looking at all of these different issues. Uh, this issue that you mentioned about the international students will definitely be raising that. See you soon.